I've got some sweet peas that I'm going to plant in this big pot here till I can get them outside. I don't know if y'all can hear it, but it's late outside. <laughs> but I'm just going to, these have got such good roots on them. And I've got some more planted to put outside in the garden just soon as we're able to get them out there. It's just been way too cold. Today we've got sleet and we've got snow coming. But these sweet peas are doing really good here in the greenhouse. But I need to get them potted in a deeper pot. So that's what I'm doing today. Look at the roots on that. My broccoli and my cabbage, um, my kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, greens, all that stuff is still doing really good. Not growing much, but still doing good in the cold weather. The pond is plum froze over today. The ducks don't know what to do. It is so cold. But there's a reason for every season. And our gravel road is just a solid sheet of ice. Roads can get very dangerous when it's like this. Okay, we're out in the hen house. <laughs> And we are fixing to do some cleaning. We're going to get these hens ready for this really bad weather that's coming in. Right now it's uh, sleeting outside. So I got a lot to do. We're going to be cleaning out the hen boxes and uh, cleaning up the, the bottom of the chicken coop. Of course, we keep all that for our garden and stuff. Uh, let it dry out through the winter and let it sit. But uh, we need to get these hens ready um, for all this cold weather that's coming up. Because it does stress them a little bit. Boy, I tell you, I'm really pretty today, ain't I? Pretty enough to be on the cover of a magazine. Look at me. <laughs> Anyways, let's get started. Always wear a mask when you're doing this, too. Because that yucky dust flies everywhere. It's not good for you to breathe.
Okay, we're going to be cleaning out the nest boxes. And I'm just going to take out those old cedar shavings out of here. They're really not that bad, but they need to be cleaned out. And I'm going to put fresh shavings in there. It's always good to, uh, to clean the boxes out every so often. Keep them clean. Okay, we got them all cleaned out. Now we're going to start putting some more cedar shavings in here. And usually I just, uh, I fill the nest boxes up just a little less than half because they're real bad about scratching and, and kicking the shavings out. So I, I try not to, to waste it. But I put enough in there to give them a good, good nice nest to, to get in and to lay their eggs. They've been good to us. They lay us a lot of eggs. They don't. They might slow down um, about once a year. They'll slow down a little bit, but not much. We're always getting eggs from these hens. So that looks pretty good. Now, what I do, what I put in these with the cedar shavings is um, I put some dried herbs in here. I usually keep back, and in this bag I've got some lavender and some mint that I left over from last year that I, I dried and I keep some back just for the nest boxes. The lavender is really good for the hens. It kind of de-stresses them and it's just really good for them. And uh, the mint, there's so many good things for it that the mint is good for, but one of the main reasons is to keep the mice out. Mice don't like the smell of mint, peppermint, any kind of mint. I got some DE here that I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit in there. Now I don't use as much DE in the winter time as I do in the spring and summer, but I still like to put some in there. Just kind of mix that up real good, and and that's <laughs> it's dusty, but good job. Now we're just going to do the rest of them. Okay, we're done. We got the bottom of the coop clean. We got their nest boxes good and clean. I put cedar shavings down on the floor and put some DE down there a little bit. Their nest boxes are all good and clean and smell good. It smells really good in here between the cedar and the lavender and the mint. It smells really good. So the hens will be happy. If they're happy, I'm happy. I cleaned out the, the duck house too and put them some clean bedding in there. Okay, we're done outside and we're going to come in and make us some French toast. And this is some of the easiest French toast you'll ever make. It's easy, but mainly it's quick. i got four eggs in here and I'm going to put about a half a cup of heavy cream. If you don't have heavy cream, you can use milk or you can use half and half. You can use evaporated milk, whatever you got. I'm just going to mix this up real good. This is a really good recipe if you're feeding a lot of people. I'm going to put a fourth of a cup of brown sugar. And I'm going to put about a teaspoon of vanilla, but not the cap. <laughs> Leave the cap out. And I'm going to put about a teaspoon of cinnamon. If you don't like cinnamon or you're allergic to it, you can leave it out. I really like quite a bit of cinnamon on my French toast. This is such a good recipe, like I said, if you're feeding a lot of people. You can double and triple this and make you several sheet pan of it, or you can do you a, a big um, sheet pan full of it. Um, it's really good to do if you want to put it in the freezer too. But just make sure you get this stirred up good. And I've got a nonstick pan 
but even though it's non-stick, I still you still want to spray it with some non-stick spray. If you don't have any non-stick spray, you can uh, put you some oil on there, or you can put butter on it. Either one, you still need to uh, to do one or the other because you know eggs tend to stick to anything, even a non-stick pan. And you see how the shot the sides come up about about an inch and a half. Uh, sides on this sheet pan. That's what you need. So we're going to pour our egg mixture on here. And this is a little bit bigger than a 9 by 13 sheet pan. I'm not sure. I think it's a 10. A 10 by something. I can't remember. But anyways, any size sheet pan is going to work. Uh, but you do want at least a 9 by 13. And like I said, the bigger, the more toast you'll be able to make. You just double or triple your recipe. And you can use any kind of bread. It don't matter what kind of bread you use. I've got, uh, I had a loaf of brioche uh, sliced bread that's been in the freezer for a while. So I thought I'd use it. I think I'll be able to get eight slices of, of bread on this pan. And that's more than Mr. Brown and I'll eat, but I can put the rest of it up in the freezer or he can eat what's left over tomorrow. So you just kind of dip your bread in it and turn it over. This makes really good French toast, y'all. I'm just going to tip this a little bit, get some of that egg mixture down there on my last piece of bread there. And it's about that easy. I'm going to put just a little bit more cinnamon on top. Because like I said, I like cinnamon. My oven is heated 375. We're going to get this in the oven. And we're going to cook it for 8 minutes. Okay, it's come out of the oven. And we're going to flip them over. And we're going to cook them for another six minutes. And there they are. This is some of the best French toast, y'all. Especially made on this brioche bread. It's really good. It just, it turns out just almost perfect. I'm going to put, smear me some butter on here. And I've got some syrup heating up on the wood cook stove. I got me some bacon cooked. This is going to be good, y'all. I don't know how you could get any easier than that. It took about 14 minutes. And you didn't have to stand over the stove. And there it is. Hey, friends. We're going to be studying some of God's Word. It's going to, we're going to start in Acts chapter 7. And I would encourage you to start at 51. I'm going to just kind of paraphrase what has happened down to, uh, I believe, verse 58. Today we're going to be talking about Saul uh, and Ananias and Stephen. There's so many life lessons in this particular account that we have here and I'm just going to bring out a couple of points today. We're going to, uh, up there in 51 we have Stephen who is in <clears throat> Israel uh, and he is talking to the Jews and he's telling them that that they're stiff-necked and that they're not accepting God's Word. Well, this angers the Jews, and they take Stephen out of the city, and I would encourage you to read that, at least starting at 51. They're taking Stephen out of the city to stone him. And <clears throat> we're going to start in verse 58, Acts chapter 7, verse 58. We're going to learn about a man named Saul, who later... Uh, use the name Paul. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witness laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man 
named Saul. So we see where Saul comes into the Bible, uh, the first mention that I'm aware of right now, that Saul, who later becomes Paul, a disciple for Christ, he is, it is believed that Paul was a a well-educated man and that he was respected by by the people of Israel and and uh, and we have him here approving of Stephen being stoned. They laid their their clothes or their coats or whatever they maybe took off so they could throw stones. They laid them at his feet, and then we're going to go up to chapter eight, the first verse. It says, "Now Saul was consenting to this death." And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church of which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And a devout man carried Stephen to bury and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And then we're going to skip over to continue about Saul. We're going to skip over to chapter 9 of Acts. Chapter 9. Kind of a lengthy reading, but bear with me. Then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him of the synagogues of Damascus so that it may, that he found any who were in the way, any of those that, in the way, any of those that are Christians, whether man or woman, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he was wanting to go to Damascus and he had gotten written permission from the high priest to go bring in Christians, to bind them, to bring them to jail. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, which is Damascus, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. So Saul had become blind. He opened his eyes, but he could see no one. But they led him, they, the men that were with him, they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight. He neither ate nor drank. So we see that Paul was a persecutor. He persecuted hauled off the prison, and even allowed death to come to Christians. And Jesus come to him on his road to Damascus and asked him why he persecuted him and, and struck him blind and told him what he needed to do to change his ways. So we see that, you know, Paul, he really believed that what he was doing was for the best of his country, for the these Christians were going to cause problems. And he really believed that he thought that he was doing the right thing. Uh, I don't believe Paul was just a 
murderer, just a man of evil, because he didn't just kill anybody. He had picked out the Christians to persecute. He believed, I really believe that he believed that he was doing what was right. And then Jesus come to him on the road to Damascus and struck him blind. And we're going to continue on. Chapter 9, verse 10. This is where Ananias comes in to the picture. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. The next thing that Ananias says would be pretty common. I don't believe that Ananias is questioning the Lord. He's just reaffirming to himself that you're talking about Saul. In chapter uh, 9, verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard of many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority, here being Damascus, he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. And the Lord says, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is my chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias, and Ananias went his way, and he entered the house. Laying his hands upon him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. Now we read up here in 9, chapter 9, verse 9, that Saul had been three days without eating, without drinking. What was the first thing that he done? Ananias had come to him and laid his hands on him. He was able to see. He didn't go get drink. He didn't go get food. What was the first thing that he done? The Holy Spirit, had, he had been filled with the Holy Spirit, so he had the wisdom. He knew what he needed to do. The first thing that he'd done, he arose and he was baptized. Baptized into Christ. Baptism, you are immersed in water. You come in contact with the blood of Christ. You're raised out of the water to walk a newness of life. All of your sins are forgiven, are forgiven at that point. And then, of course, you must remain faithful to God. I think it's important that we see that Paul knew what he was supposed to do. To have his sins forgiven for the life that he had been living. And then it said in 19, so when he had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And then in verse 20, Saul starts preaching in Damascus, Christ. I would encourage you to read 
of course, all of God's Word, and I would encourage you to read uh, chapter 7, 8, and 9, and on through to maybe have a little better understanding, if you uh, need to, about what's going on. I hope you all uh, have a, a blessed day, and uh, I thank everybody for all your prayers and your cards I, I received. I can't even tell you how many cards I received to wishing me for get well with my COVID. And I am doing lots better. I still have a cough, but my strength is returning and I feel a lot better at the end of the day. And I pray that the Lord blesses you this day and the days of your life and that we strive to study God's word, to pray for wisdom to understand what he wants us to do so that we may spend eternity with him. May God bless you.